God that we need not worry because the faithfulness of God will never fail. We saw the uh, hard-headedness of the Israelites, of this vicious cycle that they have uh, shown in their history as a nation, but in that vicious cycle of uh, disobeying God and turning away from the Lord, we can always see a constant theme of the amazing grace of God. That no matter what, His forgiveness is always ready, it is always available, and God holds no grudges to anybody. And as we see that, we appreciate the goodness of God and His kindness, and we cannot help but apply those things to ourselves because how, though how much we condemn Israel, we can see that we are worse than them. That in spite of the grace of God that, has give, that were, was given to us, and that God has shown so many, many times, we always turn our backs on Him, we always uh, disobey Him, and most of the time, He is not First, in our lives, in our list, there are so many things that we pursue in life other than pursuing the glory of God. Where, in fact, we know from the Bible that we are encouraged that in whatsoever we do, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. But most of the time, we're trying to do things for our own glory. And that is the theme of the last days. We are forsaking the glory of God and we are trying to establish our own glory. We are trying everything there is under the sun in order to remove God from His rightful place and to put ourselves, even our denomination, on the throne. And that is so sad. And because of that, we are continually being divided and we are actually uh, fighting against each other because we cannot help but to stand and contend for the faith if we see that others are drifting away. Uh, there, there are so many things that are going on right now and there are so many conflicts of interest and there are so many decisions that must be made in order to make a stand for the Lord because even Christians cannot agree on the Bible anymore. They couldn't agree on what the Bible is teaching anymore. It is now all about pragmatism. It is now all about the advantage that we can gain from the things that we are doing. But anyway, uh, no matter what happens, God is still on the throne and He will always occupy His rightful place. Shall we stand up please and let us pray? Father, thank you for what we have heard. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons that you have given us in the history of Israel and their confession. And thank you, Lord, for giving us a new perspective that confession is not only telling the truth about our sins, but mostly proclaiming who you are. And as we see and proclaim who you are, then like Isaiah, we will see that we are undone and that we are living in the midst of people with unclean lips, O oh God. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to understand these things and help us, Lord, that we may be able to apply these things in our lives so that people will see, O oh God, that prayerfully, hopefully, and only by your grace, O oh God, that they will see that there are still people who will stand for the truth and will not be afraid, will not back down but will stand firm or, and even go on the offensive, O God, in order to show the word that your principle must always stand and that there is a standard that cannot be washed away by the flood of popular decisions that are happening in our time. But we will not remove the ancient landmark and we will remain standing, Lord, for what is right according to your word. Because your word is absolute and therefore no place for error. We thank you, O God, for what we have read a while ago regarding the text that we will start today. Continue, Lord, to speak to us, encourage us, that even in the midst of darkness, O God, your light through us 
will continue to shine and will continue to be a beacon of light and a hope, Lord, for those people who still want the truth and the salvation, Lord, that you're offering. Help me, Lord, as I preach. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. So I will be preaching today about solid foundation. Solid foundation. So we have read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 to 26. And we can see that uh, this letter of Paul to Timothy is something that is very important in order to prepare a man of God that will handle churches or a church so that he will be strong enough in order to not only teach the people, but to warn them against impending danger that is out there to destroy the church and everything that is good that the Lord has established here on earth. Paul wrote two letters to, Tim to Timothy, and in both those letters, there are strong warning against the dangers of apostasy. Apostasy is now in its, uh, we shall say, strongest point in time, because we are in the last days, and so many people are departing from the truth, departing from what the Bible is teaching, and establishing the truth as we interpret them by ourselves. So apostasy is really appearing or rearing its ugly head in the church, and it will only continue to increase until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So we can see before we proceed to verse number 4, that even during the time of the Apostle Paul, there are so many doctrines that are not biblical that are being spread or teach in the church of, being taught in the church of God. So we can see that the Apostle Paul taught it wise to write to Timothy so that he will warn him that one important job that Timothy, as a young pastor, must do is to charge some that they teach no other doctrine but the doctrine that were committed to them by the Lord Jesus Christ. If during that time some are teaching other doctrines, we can say that after more than 2,000 years, there are now many who are teaching other doctrine. Verse number 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. So we can see that those other doctrines that are being taught are only ministering questions rather than edification. That is the reason why we try to prove them, we try to scrutinize them, we try to analyze so that we will see if they are biblical. If not, then we definitely will raise question in order to see the authenticity of what they are teaching. But then if you know the word of God, we will find out that what they're teaching is not actually according to God's word. But it is only accord, according to how they rest the word of God in order to gain favor from the people of God who are unsuspecting, but nevertheless weak and foolish, and to other people who may give them benefit so that they will be able to live a life that is uh, comfortable at the expense of other people. In chapter 4, verse 1 of 1 Timothy, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So that is that. Because when the Lord establishes church, He entrusted to the church His doctrine. The doctrine of God. The truth of the word of God. But sad to say, even during the time of the Apostle Paul, there are already doctrines of devils that are being uh, uh, proclaimed in the very church of God. By the very people who should be proclaiming the truth. 
So you can see that the parable of the wheat and the tares is very much in play in the churches during the time, especially in our churches today. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They do not care about sound doctrine anymore. Actually, the truth of the matter is that people, especially people who are standing behind the pulpit, are so careless that they, they will even make pronouncements that are very unbiblical and yet they are proud to say it. Like for example, there is now, because of the discussion about the National Baptist Day, there is this uh, preposterous pastor who said that if you do not believe in the National Baptist Day, then you are unsafe. That is the height of stupidity. That is ridiculous. And from a man who proclaimed to be a pastor, from a man who said that he was called by God to proclaim these things, is simply blasphemy. Blasphemous and heretical for a man of God. You see, they are willing to say things that are basically against the word of God in order to silence those people who are teaching those things that are written in the word of God. That they will not endure some doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You see, they will listen to those people that will tickle their fancy. They will listen to those people that will agree with them. You see, the thing is this. If I don't like you, I don't like everything that you will do. If I like you, it doesn't matter what you do, I like what you're going to do. So if I do not like you, even if you're right, then it is wrong. And if I like you, even if it is, even if it is wrong, then it is right. That is what's happening in our time. And that's why Paul is uh, uh, charging Timothy to correct all of these things. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. What are those fables? The things that their minds have concocted to be true. The things that they believe to be true. Like for example, what is happening in our time? There are churches accepting transgender into their staff so that they say we can minister to all kinds of people. They will even use the verse that the Apostle Paul says that I am all things to all men so that by all means we can save some. Ladies and gentlemen, being all things to all men does not necessarily mean that we go down to their level but to maintain the standard and lift up the name of God so that salvation will be understood according to the word of God. Amen. You do not go down to their level in order to reach them. The standard of God is always high. And people must bow down so that they will be lifted up by God in order to subscribe to the standard of the Lord. What are these fables? Fables that believing, if we can only be recognized by the unbelievers, then we can have a headway in leading them to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's fable. Why? Because unbelievers will recognize everything and anything that is according to them. But they will never recognize anything or everything that is against them. That's why the Bible says, Love not the word, neither the things that are in the word. The system of the word is in complete opposition to the system of God. In the world, in order to rise up, you need to step on people. But in the economy of the Bible, according to the principle of God, if you will be humble and bow down yourself, then that's the only time that God will lift you up. In the world, in order to gain, you need to keep. But in the world, in order to gain, you need to lose. So that is why when we subscribe to the system of the world, then we are turning away from the principle, the teaching, and the system of God. Don't you know that in our country, in the Philippines, the government have recognized Iglesia Ni Cristo? Don't you know that our government recognizes the LGBT community? Don't you know that our government recognizes that Jesus is Lord? 
church? Don't you know that our government recognizes the new people's army? Why? Because these are forces to be reckoned with. And don't you know that our group, the Baptists, who are supposed to be separated from the state, is now trying to get recognition. Why? So that we can have political clout, so that people will listen to us. Ladies and gentlemen, they will not. Because we will only be uh, recognized in the level of those they have already recognized. What they are recognizing, not recognizing, is we are bringing down the level of God to the level of this world. And sad to say, so many people are subscribing to that fad and trend that is going on in our time. I read a post just this morning. He said, it's about time for the government to listen to us before they make any law in the Philippines. And this is what I say, baloney. They will never listen to us. Pwede tayong utuin na kunyari nakikinig sila. Pero hindi sila makikinig. Because no matter what you do, this, most of these government officials will only make laws that will benefit them. And not actually for the benefit of people. So when Paul wrote this letter, there were plenty of false teachers in the professing church. As I have said today, we are in a worse condition in our churches. It is alarming situation and it threatens to bring discouragement to God's people. Why? Because we may think that we are losing the battle. We may construe that what is happening today is uh, putting us in a very dangerous position of losing uh, what was given to us by God because even in our ranks we are not united. And this, are the, this is the very uh, philosophy that these people are actually shouting today and proclaiming that we should be united. Why? Because Jesus even prayed that those that were given Him should be united. But what they do not understand is unity must always be according to the truth, not according to convenience. That is the unity that they are trying to uh, foster in our time. The work of the church is difficult and our progress in the gospel is actually very slow. But ladies and gentlemen, in spite of this, we can be optimistic. Why? Because God already promised us the victory. God already said in His Word that we are more than conquerors. God has already proclaimed that He has overcome the world. And God has given us the faith that can, over, that can give us victory. And that victory is the faith that God has placed in our hearts. Amen? So we can see even in these verses that the Apostle Paul brings us the picture that we are standing on a solid foundation that the Lord has laid. And therefore, if God has laid that foundation, that foundation will never be shaken, even by the greatest earthquake that may happen in our spiritual life. Amen. Because when God laid the foundation, it is firm, it is unmovable, it is sound, it, was, it will always remain until the end of time. Amen. The foundation is absolutely secure. That foundation will not be able to move. And that foundation, uh, there is an inscription that that foundation is going to be protected by God. And that foundation is in the hands of the Lord. So we can see that in our foundation there are two seals. One, God word, and the other Man word. And we are we're going to study this later on so that we can understand why our foundation is solid and our foundation is something that can never be moved or can never be shaken. So let us look at and focus our study in verse number 19 where the Bible says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. 
and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What can we see in this verse that will be the basis of our study today? Number one, we should have confidence. Number one, we should have confidence. What is it? A confidence that despite the great forces that are opposing the church right now, all those wrong doctrines, all those people that are trying to destroy the church, even though apostasy is blooming in our time, even though apostasy is in every side of the church, even though worldliness is creeping into the church, even though shallowness is happening in the spiritual experience of God's people, even though there is apathy in the service of the Lord, despite of all these things, God's foundation will stand firm. God's foundation will never be destroyed. We need to realize the force of the word, nevertheless. If you're going to look at verse 16, can we uh, go there down to 18? But shun profane and vain bubblings. We have profane and vain bubblings going on in our time. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Ungodliness is found even in the church of God. 17. And their word will eat as that a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, people that are against the word of God, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of many, even these things are happening. Verse 19 says, Nevertheless, Nevertheless, it means in spite of all these things, the foundation is standing, the foundation will continue to stand, the foundation will never be moved, no matter what Satan can do, he cannot destroy the foundation of God. Amen. And what is that foundation? Our faith, our security, our salvation in the hands of the mighty God. Amen. No matter what they do, there are people who will always stand for what? is right according to the word of God. Amen? Amen? You see, what is this foundation? It is the security of our salvation. No matter what they do, they may teach us wrong, but our salvation will remain the same. Amen. They may try to, to pull us out of the will of God, but our salvation will be protected by God. What is this? The security of our faith. It is secured because of the mediating work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our faith is being kept by the power of God. That even though there are many antichrists, even though there are many false teachers, the truth will continue to be proclaimed by people who were chosen and called by God. Amen. That's why we have to stand. That's why we have to contend for the faith. Because if we will be quiet, if we will not say anything, what will happen is it seems... That wrong is triumphing over what is right. That's why it's my responsibility. That's why it is your responsibility. That we need to do our part in this battle for the truth. You see, our foundation is promised by the completeness of our salvation. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So when God has given you a faith, He will work on that faith. And no matter what happens, He will finish that faith. So can, can the devil destroy my faith? No, he cannot. He may shake it for a while. He may put doubt for a while. But that faith will remain secure. Why? Because the truth is powerful than error. We cannot let error win over the truth because God already ordained that the truth will be victorious. And who is the truth? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen? Look at Hebrews 12, 1. This is what we have mentioned a while ago. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There is a race, it may be hard, it is not easy, but ladies and gentlemen, every step of the way in that race is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our destiny is already secured. We are bound to reach the finish line. No matter how hard the journey will be, no matter how hard the race will be, no matter, no matter how hard the fight will be, in the end, we will be standing up because we're standing on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, signifying it is finished. We are already victorious. We just have to appropriate that in our lives. You see, the sad thing is that we are the champion, but we live like losers. We are the victorious ones. But our lives is like we are those that are being conquered instead of us being more than conqueror. Have you forgotten Philippians 1.6? Where the Lord Jesus Christ gave us a very strong assurance when He said that being confident. A word of confidence. Being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you, in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it is all a formality. But the sad thing is that we are even failing in the formality that should happen before the actual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil has convinced us that we cannot win. And therefore, we are not going to live as if we are fighting for victory, but we are fighting a losing battle. But he said, nevertheless, the foundation standeth sure. Amen? Amen? What a word of confidence. It means we need not fear for the safety of God's people because we are safe in the hands of God. The foundation of God will never be destroyed. So all will be well. And ladies and gentlemen, this should be our confidence. Amen? Amen? We should be confident, not in ourselves, but confident in God and the foundation that He has laid before us. Number two, we should be comforted. We should be comforted. I know it seems that things are getting worse and worse. Actually, that's what the Bible says. Before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be like during the time of Noah or even worse than that. Meaning to say that the darkness will become darker. It means to say that apostasy will still bloom some more. It means to say that the world will continue to go down the drain. You cannot expect for anything that will become better because it was already prophesied that things will become worse before they become better. And that is what the, the Word of God says. But in spite of all these things, let us be comforted because the Bible says, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Amen. Amen. No matter what is happening, God knows that I am His. God knows that you are His. We know that God belongs to us. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for a year of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. He knew that we belong to Him. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. And no man will be able to pluck them out of my hands. Ladies and gentlemen, we should be comforted that no matter what is happening, God is in control. Amen. And He knows us. He knows what He's doing for us. Notice that it does not only say that the Lord knows about all who belong to Him, but He actually knows them and He has a tender regard for us. 
Because we belong to God. He loved us. The Bible says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In Isaiah or Jeremiah, he said, that a mother may forget the son or the daughter that came from her womb. But God said that even if the mother may forget, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That is the promise of God. You see, the Bible teaches absolute security not only of our salvation, but of our faith. Absolute security of everything that God has given us. Why? Because He made it this way. By His own election. He elected us according to His foreknowledge. By His holy calling. He has called us with a holy calling. By the miracle of the new birth. And nobody can unbirth us when we were birthed by the Lord Jesus Christ. By the blood washing of the Lord Jesus and by the operation of the Holy Spirit by whom they have been built into the building of God or the body of Christ which is secured and will remain forevermore. So that is our assurance. That is our security. But pastor, how about those who fell away? Those who fall away. What can you say about those people? Well, surely this must be professors and they are not possessors. Of the Spirit of God. Because if the Spirit is in you, the Spirit can overpower you so that you will go back to the path that God has prepared for you. You see, when we say that our God is a sovereign God, it means that He controls everything. The reason why there is chastisement is because that is God's control or security that His children will realize if they are wrong and they will go back to the path that God has prepared for them. Pwede siguro magulang natin, pag pinapalo tayo, we can, we can even defy them. But we cannot defy the chastisement of God. Sa madaling sabi, matinding mamalo ang Diyos. Hindi tulad natin. Yung palo natin, minsan bumabakat, pero ang palo ng Diyos ay nananatili magpakilanman. And God will see to it that we are not going to despise the chastisement of God. Why? Because God is a powerful God. God is a sovereign God. He created us. He knew us. And He knew how to discipline each of His children. Amen? So if they will not come back, it shows that they are not possessors of eternal life. They are merely professors. They may have faith in their heads, but there is no saving faith in their hearts. Because you see, People can be very, very knowledgeable from the Word of God. Soriano is knowledgeable in the Word of God, but in a philosophical way. The Iglesia and the Cristo have uh, some knowledge from the Word of God, but if you listen to them, especially when you listen to, uh, they said, Ed uh, Lapis, the cousin of Ed Bolpen, uh, he can really give uh, explanation coming from the Word of God, uh, Kuya Clem and uh, who uh, is this from DZ uh, AS they can give good counsel even uh, using the word of God they may have a head knowledge of the word of God because the Bible is a book it is not an ordinary book it is a supernatural book but don't you know that the Bible can be an ordinary book to unsaved people and they can treat is the, the Bible is a literary book they can treat the Bible as a historical book or some other kind of book. And because they contain knowledge, they may have a head knowledge of the Word of God. But if the Holy Spirit will not illuminate them, that will only happen during the time of salvation, then their only knowledge of the Word of God is up here on their head, but never in their heart. And they will really never understand the operation of the Holy Spirit to those people whom God has chosen, have called, have birthed into God's family and were washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may hold the lamp of testimony, but there is no oil in their lamps. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? Only those with oil in their lamps were able to enter in. But those without oil in their lamps we're not able to enter in. Why? Because the oil signifies the Holy Spirit. And only people with the Holy Spirit will be accepted by God. Amen? 
They may think that they have it. But the truth of the matter is, they don't. And let us remember about the parable of the tares and the wheat, that there are tares inside the churches that were planted by the devil. And these tares, they look like the same as the wheat. So sometimes we cannot even know the difference. But Jesus says, don't worry, because time will come. They will be separated. And they will be exposed for who they are by the grace of God. So all who fall away were never really of the true foundation. Because if they are of the true foundation, then they will not fall away. And they will exemplify the life and character of a saved person. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So this case is a warning to us that there may be some sitting here or some standing here who do not belong to the foundation of God. That is why it behooves us to really understand, to really search, and to really dig deeper into our hearts if we really belong to Jesus by virtue of our repentance and our faith and the evidence that will be seen in our lives because if we are not sure of this and sadly if we are wrong about this then it will cost us our eternity and maybe we can ask the questions why is it that I am not really into what is going on spiritually is maybe there is simply no spirit in us that is why we cannot be attracted to this battle don't you know that there are soldiers who are really fighting for their country and there are soldiers who are only fighting for themselves. Those soldiers fighting for their country are willing to die. But those who are fighting for themselves will a cower in the midst of battle. They will hide. They will run. Why? Because they are not really into it. The same thing with us. If we have the Spirit of God, then we will involve ourselves in the spiritual battle that we are in in the last days that's why we need to see to it that we are in the true foundation so that we can fight the battle that god has prepared for us as the lord looks at the professing church he knows those in that church who belongs to him and also the devil will have an idea of those who belong to him you see sometimes during our service maybe the devil will attend and he will look at the people and he will even walk the aisle. And as he walk the aisle, he will walk and then he will see somebody sleeping during the preaching and he will say, ha ha, that belongs to me. And he will see people talking to each other while the preaching is going on, ha ha, they belong to me. And then he will, he will even suspect that other people, people's mind are roaming around or flying somewhere else while the preaching is going on and the devil says, ah, that may be mine. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be here, but it will not make you a Christian to be here. A Christian is a person who repented of his sin, opened his heart, and accepted Jesus as a Savior and as a new creature according to the Word of God and living a life that's pleasing to God. He may fall, he may stumble, but he will stand up and keep going forward for the glory of God. And we need to understand that. Because if not, we might fall into the play of the devil of believing we are saved when the truth of the matter is that we are not. You see, in this verse is the guarantee of our protection. You notice the word His. The Lord knoweth them that are His. He looks at each member of His church and says, You are mine. You belong to me. And because you are mine, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. 
And because I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, you are protected by my power. Look at John chapter 10, verse number 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I'm known of mine. And then if you will go forward to 20, 29, that we are protected in his hand and we are protected in the hands of the Father. Not only that, but this verse is the guarantee of his purpose in our life. Because he knew us, he made a plan for us that he is working on and will see to it that it's going to be accomplished. Look at Job chapter 23, verse number 10. Job 23, 10. The Bible says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, Job knew that the thing that is happening in his life is because of the purpose of God. There is a purpose. There is a reason why. One purpose we can see, Job cannot see this, but because we already have the Bible, we can see that one purpose is God is proving to the devil that not all people are under his power. That not all people will serve God for naught. That not all people will only be serving God because of what they can gain or get from serving the Lord. But there are people who purely love God and will serve him even though there is nothing in return to be gained. Amen. That is one purpose. Number two, he's preparing Job for a greater ministry because after everything that Job suffered, it strengthened his faith. And I believe that if he was able to uh, conquer all of this tremendous, huge trials in life, then he will be able to overcome everything that the devil can throw at him. Therefore, giving a testimony that will glorify the name of God. Amen? There is a purpose. Let us compare that to Psalms chapter 37, 23 to 24. 37, 23 to 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. That's why there is no perpetual backsliding. That is why there is no uh, what we call complete apostasy in the life of a believer. Because he may fall, but he will not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. We are in the hands of God. No matter what happens, we are going to be upheld by the power of God. That is why when something bad happens in our lives, be of good cheer because God is working in our lives to accomplish something that only He can do by allowing these things to happen to us. And then look at Romans 8, 28 to 30. Very, very familiar with us. And we know. Do you know? Mm. Amen? Amen. Paul says we, we should know. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. You ask yourself the question, do I love God? If your answer is yes, then you should know. No matter what it is, you don't ask the question, why is this happening to me? You ask the question, what is the purpose of God? For allowing these things to happen to me. Why? Because you know. That no matter what happens. It will work for our good. Why? Because we love God. And we are called according to his purpose. When you are called by the military. And the military is training you. Listen to me. You may see things that may be ridiculous. During the training. You may even ask the question, Ano ka ba? Kanina ka pa. Hindi mo matay, matay naman, aray. You may ask the question, Is this really important? Is it really important to eat your food without bending your head? Is it really important to wake up 
2, 3, or 4 o'clock in the morning and jog for 2, 3, or 4 hours? Is it really important to crawl through the mud? And all of these things, are they really important? You may say they're ridiculous, but there is a purpose. Why they design these things? How can marching give any advantage to you during the time of war? Sige nga. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Ubalik. No. One, two, three, four. Ligo sa kaliwa. One, two, three, four. Lakad pabalik. No. One, two, three, four. What advantage will that give you during the time of battle? No, of course, no advantage if you will look at it at its face value, but if you will look at the time, at, at the area of discipline, that you know how to follow orders, that you know how to be in sync with the people, that you know that you are working as a unit, not as an individual, it will be a matter of life and death during the time of battle. That is the importance of it. What it is instilling in our hearts. And ladies and gentlemen, no matter what is happening in our life, if we are in the purpose of God, there is a reason. And it will make us successful if we will follow the Lord. Amen? Amen. All things for good. 29. For whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. You see, that is conforming to the image of His Son. Why? The Lord Jesus Christ says that He was tempted in all points and yet without sin. Meaning to say that all of these things are conforming us as we gain victory after victory after victory in the temptations and trials in our lives. Then we are slowly conforming to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. The end or the final destination is to be completely conformed in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So there is a purpose. Look at Hebrews 7.25. The Bible says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. What's the purpose? Our final destination. What is the purpose? When we finally meet the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. That's why he began a good work. And that good work that he began in us, he is going to perform until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And not only that, but this verse is a guarantee of His provision because God knoweth those that are His. Therefore, He knew what they need and because He knew what they need, Paul says, but my God shall supply all your needs. That's why we need not worry. But it makinig kayo. Sister Shine just gave me the uh, summary of our giving last year from January to December. And as I look at them, I thank God for the faithfulness of His people. But as I look at them, there are some areas wherein I, I was saddened. Because some of you has, might have given up on his or her belief in the provision of God. Because some of you withheld some money that you should have given to the ministry of the Lord. And that is so sad. Why? Have you not faith that God will supply all your needs if you're going to be a faithful steward of God? Nawala na ba yung pananampalataya mo na hindi ka pababayaan ng Diyos? Mga kapatid, tinan mo, Hindi ka nagbigay masyado o halos hindi ka nagbigay. Hindi mo ba nakikita nagpapatuloy pa rin ang gawain? Kahit hindi ka magbigay, magtutuloy ito. Pero kawawa ka. Hindi ka lumalago. Hindi ka nagtitiwala sa Diyos. Pinapakita mo na that 
you are losing your faith in God's promise of provision. Nanungkot ako. Hindi dahil nabawasan ng offering. I don't even care. Ibig sabihin, alam ko ang Diyos magpo-provide. Pag may pangangailangan tayo, nagamit ang Diyos ng tao. Tinan niyo nangyari sa mga preacher natin na deny sa Amerika, pero may ginamit na tao para masuportahan sila. Hindi pa nangyayari yan sa history ng deputation, mga kapatid. Ngayon pa lang. Hindi nagpapabaya ang Diyos. Pero kung hindi mo nakikita yun, sayang. Dahil lumipas ang isang taon, nagpak- pinakita mo sa Diyos na hindi ka talaga nagtitiwala sa Kanya. Uulitin ko, whether you give or not, this ministry will continue. But ladies and gentlemen, your cooperation is crucial to our unity because God blesses unity. And we should be united in everything that we are doing for the Lord. That is only one area in your attendance. How is it? How was it? How was your last year? In your service to the Lord, how was your last year? In our conduct, in life, how was last year? So, but thank God, no matter what happened in 2019, we are now in 2020. A fresh start given to us by God. So we have a war. We have we must be confident, amen? We must be comforted. But then we will end up with a word of caution that we have to be careful. You have to be careful. Yes, we have confidence because the foundation is sure, it's solid. It will never crack. It will never be moved. Yes, we are comforted because God promised these things will remain forever, will remain until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must also be reminded that we have to be careful. Why? The word of confidence and the word of comfort is always followed, if you will look at the Bible, with the word of caution. There was a verse in the Bible which says, Let, let him therefore that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And in every victory, we have to be careful because when you are at the top, then the only way is down. And we have to be careful. And the word of Caution is this. Let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the thought here is that if a professing Christian gives no evidence of turning away from wickedness, then there is no evidence of real Christianity in him. And if there is no evidence of real Christianity in him, then that person, though how pious he may be, is not part of the foundation of God. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. The Bible is very clear. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, good works is sinful in the sight of God if it is not done according to His name by people who have been saved by His name. Why? Pastor, makasalanan ba tumulong sa mga mahihirap? Oo, oh, makasalanan kung hindi ka ligtas. Kasi ginagawa mo yun, ang purpose mo para ikaw ay tanggapin sa langit. So you are defying. And you are neglecting. And you are rejecting. And you are opposing what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. But in the eyes of mere men, they are good because they are good works. They are commendable. Why? Because they are being done to alleviate the poverty of the people that are hungry for food. But ladies and gentlemen, if it is done because of a purpose of self-gain, then that is sin before God. And only people with the Holy Spirit of God can do good things. Why? Because Isaiah proclaimed that even our 
unrighteousness if you are unsaved is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Kaya minsan hanga, hanga tayo kay Mother Teresa. Because she has given all her life to help the poor in India, especially in Calcutta. But have you read the life of Mother Teresa? Don't you know that he, she had a vision and she lived that vision for a year and then she lived the rest of his, her life doubting if there is even a God and if there is really heaven. And don't you know that she was very, very miserable when she died because there was not even an assurance of the existence of God in her heart in spite of all the good works. Why? Because she knew she is doing it for herself. And that's Mother Teresa. Punta lang kayo sa Google, basahin niyang buhay niya. Kung paano niyang ginugol. And, 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 and Mother Teresa is, is a saint to a particular religion by virtue of the good works that they have done. But the same religion that made Mother Teresa a saint because of her good works is the same religion that commend, commended Hitler for killing Jews during that war. So that's, that's, ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that our works will not automatically say that we are Christians, but our works is a good uh, barometer that we are really saved by the grace of God. Amen? If we are really the Lord's people, we shall turn away from iniquity. We shall turn away from wickedness. Why? Because the name of Jesus Christ is not associated with iniquity. It is not associated with sin. It is not associated with things that are sinful or that are against the will of God. Ayan ka na naman. Kanina pa. Asan ako? Oh, Matthew 121, para mabawi ko yung bearing ko. Ayan. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Meaning to say, because Jesus came to save his people from their sins, so our salvation is not basically only from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. So if you are unsaved, you have no power to resist sin. Because we are a servant of sin. But now that we have been forgiven, now that we are born again, now that we are a child of God, then we now are given the power to resist sin in our lives and to do what is good and right in the sight of God. Therefore, he says, if you name the name of Christ, then our default is to depart from iniquity. Though, from time to time, we may fall, but we will stand up and continue serving the Lord. So, Pastor, what is this iniquity? This iniquity referred uh, here includes any transgression of the commands of Christ. It includes all forms of lawlessness. If you're going against the law, not, not, not basically the Old Testament law, but the law of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that is iniquity. It also refers to doctrinal iniquity. When you teach something that is wrong, that is er erroneous, that is heretical, as mentioned above in our text, that Hymenaeus and Philetus, they are teaching that the resurrection is already past. There will never be any resurrection anymore. So they are teaching erroneous, a heretical teaching. We need to depart from that kind of teaching. That's why, if, if you know people that are attending the, the church of Becher, Maglintek, ay Maglinti, uh, Senior, you warn them that they should leave the church. Why? Because he is a heretic teaching that if you do not believe on the National Baptist Day, then you are unsaved. And he even curse. Yung kanyang PI, malutong na malutong. 
And he even judge people that he doesn't even know. So it includes doctrinal uh, iniquity. When you are teaching something that is not being taught by the word of God, you have to shun away from those people and you should not attend those kind of churches. Why? Depart from iniquity. You see, let us go back to our text before we uh, end this whole thing. Our text is 2 Timothy 2.19. But go up to 16. You see, but shun profane and vain bubblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You, you, you avoid that kind of iniquity. 17. And their word will eat as that a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. It will eat you. It will destroy you. It will give you sickness that will make you turn away from God. These people must be avoided. Depart from them. Who concerning the truth of earth? If they're not preaching the truth, the truth, depart from them. Any teaching that's not according to the word of God must be avoided. And they also refer, referring to all practical iniquity, which those men and their followers were guilty of. But speaking generally, when men make shipwreck of faith, they put away a good conscience in the lives of people. So if they are making shipwreck of faith, you avoid them. Why? They will not lead us into godliness, but they will lead us to what we call ungodliness. And the Bible says, from these men of bad principles and practice or both, we must have no fellowship with them. Kaya nga, sa National Baptist Day, iba-iba ng paniniwala yan kahit pare-parehong Baptist. Meron diyang mga okay lang magmura. Pagda pagdating doon ni Becher, at kasama ka, nakikipag-fellowship ka sa palamura. Kawa mo? Andun si Becher, kasama ka, nakikipag-fellowship ka kasi nagtuturo na yung mga wala doon, unsaved. Kamukha natin, wala tayo ron, unsaved tayo, hindi tayo niniwala sa... Kaya maniwala na tayo sa National Baptist Day para maligtas tayo. Kaya babaguhin na natin ang Bible. Hindi na si Kristo tagapagligtas. Ang tagapagligtas na National Baptist Day. So if you are there, you are fellowshipping with these people. But the Bible says we need to avoid them and not to be with them. Why? Because they are leading us into ungodliness. They are being unworthy naming the name. Of Jesus. Actually, the reference to this is in Numbers chapter 16, verse number 5. And Numbers chapter 16, verse 26. Eh, basahin lang po natin to. Ito yun eh. And he spake unto Korah and all his co company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will shew who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Alam natin tong istorya. Si Cora ay gumawa ng rebellion. At nag-ano siya na ito yung Diyos nyo. Gumawa sila ng ano, golden cult. Ito ang Diyos na nagliktas sa inyo. Sa Egypt. Habang si Moses ay, ay binibigyan ng Diyos, ng, ng law, ng Panginoon. O pagkatapos, buta tayo sa verse number 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of those wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Anong utos ni Moses? Depart from them. Why? Do not even touch of anything that they have. Why? Because you are going to be partakers of their sin. And we know what happened. That when the confrontation came, and those that are on the Lord's side went to Moses, and those that opposed God went to Korah, the earth opened her mouth, and these people were swallowed alive. And all of them died. Why? Because they made shipwreck of the faith. So we are to depart from every thought, word, and deed, which is contrary to the moral law of God. And in particular, we are to depart from worldliness, impurity, and pride. They were all mentioned and we will end here. There are three sins mentioned in this chapter that we really have to avoid. Number one is in verse number four. 
No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are to depart from worldliness. If you enlist as a soldier of Jesus, then you turn your back from every cares and worries of this world. Remember the parables of the seed and the sower that those people who receive the word of God and look at the cares of this world, they wither the way. Why? If you are with Christ, then your focus must only be according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And our eyes must be on the Lord Jesus Christ, not forgetting 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Love not the word, neither the things that are in the word. Number two, we are to depart from impurity. Look at verse number 22. 22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So there must be purity in our lives. Of course, we cannot be perfect. We cannot be totally pure. But ladies and gentlemen, there is something that we need to flee from in our lives. And everything that will corrupt our purity must be Avoid it. Look at 2 Corinthians 7 1. Paul says to the churches at Corinth, having therefore these promises, dear beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from our filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There are two filths that we need to avoid the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. The filthiness of the flesh are the things, are the sins that are being seen. Well, the filters of the Spirit are the things that are not being seen. And that will lead us to number three. We are to depart from pride. Because pride is something that emanates from our hearts. Look at verses 24 and 25. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Up to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, some of you may say, but pastor, uh, our preachers, including you, you are not gentle. You are striving. No, I'm not. We are gentle. Uh, as gentle as we can be. You see, this big betcher, if you will look at it, uh, we can pin him down. We can destroy him. I can just screenshot all the things that he says, and I can put that on my uh, profile, and I can ask people to share it, so that he will, everybody who will read it, and who knows him, he will be destroyed. But I said, no. We're not going to do that. Actually, John was tempted to post it. He actually posted it. I asked John, no, John, uh, delete that. Why? Because we are still hoping that he will acknowledge that he is wrong. That he will repent and that he's going to right the wrong that he did. And that is being gentle to these people because we want to give them a chance for repentance and they acknowledge the truth. Amen? Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And we will end here. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Let us be like the Lord Jesus Christ in meekness. He is a meek person. We should be meek. But meekness does not mean weakness. Because when they tried to dishonor the house of prayer, you saw the holy indignation that the Lord Jesus Christ did to those people. They were whipped and they were thrown away. Why? Because they made the house of prayer the dens of thieves. And we can be angry and, and sin not. If we will be angry according to the standard of the word of God. And the Lord says, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we are living in a very, very hard time. But let us rest in the confidence that we belong to him. Let us rest and be comforted that He knoweth us and He will never leave us nor forsake us. And let us rest and be vigilant 
regarding the warning that He gave us. That if we are going to be careful and walk circumspectly, then the Lord will protect us, the Lord will guide us until the time, until the time that we face Him and we hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Shall we stand up, please? Every head's bowed, please.